Hello. Well, I've been struggling with contact bumps in this uh, anemometer. It's not very important because actually nobody except human beings looks at the wind speed. We, uh, the software only looks at the wind direction. But I'd like to get it right. Um, and um, I'm feeling a bit guilty because Ollie Epsom of Drawing Board 82 uh, YouTube channel very kindly lent or gave me this beautiful weather unit which is of a much higher quality construction than this Ventus one. But the problem is it is a tweedle bit big to put on the top of the mast of Woodstock and um, I had thought, well actually probably most of the weight of this thing is in this aluminium bracket and if I just took this anemometer bit and put it in place of this one um, that might be a good idea but then I realised that actually it's not designed to be operated this way up because there's the rain is going to get in here um, so I thought well I'll do that only if I can't fix the Ventus. So this video is about fixing contact bounce in this uh, white anemometer. If you've been following the earlier videos you'll know that I uh, uh, revised the debouncing circuit for the wind speed measurements um, but looking at the latest telemetry from the trip we did at Weston, it's, the wind speed is still not satisfactory. If you look at this graph, the, the um, grey line is the instantaneous wind speed after debouncing. Um, and it's still got, which is actually clipped at a maximum of 30 mph. These readings are certainly false readings caused by contact bounce and it's quite likely that these other lower readings are also similarly false readings. Of course it's easy to get a debounce circuit that would remove this bouncing but I can only do so by increasing the time constant of the circuit and the effect of that is to put an upper limit on the maximum wind speed that I can actually measure and uh, that wouldn't be satisfactory. So I decided that something needed to be done about this. This little black thing here is a linear Hall effect sensor which um, produces a voltage of two and a half volts with no magnetic field and then it's supposed to produce a positive voltage on well, one way around it produces an, uh, the voltage goes down and the other way it goes up. So that's going from two and a half to three point one with one pole and two and a half to two point one on the other with this little Eclipse magnet which I've had since 1066. I take an even bigger magnet, I don't know where I got that one from, drive it down to 1.7 one way and 3.3, 3.5, 3 3.6 the other way. So that's definitely working. So we've got some kind of magnet in this rotating anemometer which which is sensed by a reed switch in here and I'm going to rip that out and replace it by a Hall effect sensor but before I do that, I'm just going to um, well, I'm going to put this linear Hall effect sensor in there to just see what the change in 
the magnetic field is as this rotates. But um, first I've got to get this bit of plastic off by drilling out these three plastic um, posts. Right, I, couldn't, I couldn't drill them out but I've just cut them with a um, standing knife. So hopefully this PC board will come out now. And there is the reed switch. So that suggests that um, the sensitive bit of this is, is about there, right? Bang in the middle there, slightly off centre when we put it when we put it on its posts. Where did it go? It must have gone like that. That's interesting, because that's off centre. Miles off centre, if it was like that. I have to look at the video to find out. So if it was like that, this thing goes underneath it like that, then the magnet is in fact some way off the axis. Well, I suppose that's sensible. Right, well I've fixed that sensor with blue tack. Well, I fitted that linear Hall effect sensor inside here, and so that I can just flick it like that. And um, the change in voltage is, is pretty small, so I've put it on the oscilloscope. And the waveform I get looks like this, where the downward spikes correspond to the point where the magnet in the anemometer cup comes closest to the Hall effect sensor. Uh, I've measured the depth of those spikes as 230 millivolts. The sensor I'm using generates 2.5 millivolts per gauss, so that means that the magnetic field in the location of the sensor is 92 gauss, which should be more than enough to operate a Hall effect switch if I put one in that position. The Hall effect switch that I'm proposing to use is the Honeywell SS4100 device, which, according to its spec, will operate at a minimum of 55 gauss. So that should be fine. It's a simple three terminal device where you only have to supply plus 5 volts and 0 volts and it produces a 5 volt digital output. Right, I'm just uh, preparing the uh, Hall effect switch for installation by putting some shrink, uh, heat shrink uh, sleeve in it. Let's try, 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 try this the other way around. I think it should go like that. Right, so. Let me put that like that. I just hope it stays there whilst we fix this in. Right. to be working. The output is stuck at plus 5 volts, which is not what's supposed to be happening. Well, let's see if we can get it to work with the magnet. I think it was this one that's supposed to work. So I think I've got this sensor upside down. Let's see if I can just fix 
fix that. Turn it that way up. Let's try that. Yeah, that's working. Right. Right, so I've moved it slightly, the sensor slightly closer to the center. And I think it is working now. So if I do this, let's have a look at that. Well, that's a nice clear. Wave. Right, it's got an enormous negative spike on it, which is quite surprising to me. What's that doing? What is that enormous negative spike doing? Well, it's only 50 nanoseconds wide, but it doesn't look as if it should be there. Surely I'm not on um, I'm not on AC, no. That's the zero line. We've got a four volt negative spike. Which is impossible because there's no negative voltage there. There's no negative supply. And this is nothing is capacitively coupled. So I would like to know how it manages to do that. Um, the problem with this, apart from that spike, is that the duty cycle is 87%, which means that the uh, when it drops down to zero, it only does so for 13% of the time. I'd rather it was a bit longer than that. And I'm just wondering if, if I were to move the sensor yet again, um, whether the duty cycle will change. This is not easy messing about in this bloody thing, which was not designed for this purpose at all, not, not designed for me to be messing about with it, was it? See, what I'm worried is that when it's going fast, this will be just too... The point is the software has got to be able to detect this pulse. Well, this one is short one. The shortest one I've got here is twenty millis twenty milliseconds wide. Well, that's I suppose is quite long enough. Well, let's just see if I can. Um, simulate a high wind speed, which is not easy to do with this thing. So there, the fastest one was 11 milliseconds in the um, north position, which I guess um, that's fine, the micromat can detect that. Because the micromat does not like negative voltages on its pins, um, I tried to clip this negative spike by putting a fast Schottky diode um, across it. Um, 
This display is one volt per centimeter in the vertical, whereas all previous displays were two volts per centimeter. So the spike is half the size. It's 1.8 volts now rather than four volts. And uh, only 20 nanoseconds wide, but uh, it's still there. Well, the mic might will just have to live with that because I can't get any get it any better than that, and I can't face putting a changing the whole cable, which would involve rewiring the whole of the Ventus unit. So that will have to do.